But I'd like to finish my uh, chapter that I started last week, Revelation 6. But the problem with Revelation 4, 5, and 6, you know, you just, you just can't start in the middle. I mean, it's, a, it's something that proceeds out of the throne room of God. This is what makes the book of Revelation especially takes you, like no other book in the Bible, it takes you right into heaven. And, you know, the, the events that happen in that throne room uh, play themselves out on this earth. And basically in, in Revelation 4, you, you, he's taken up from this earth to heaven. And he, he's given a tour of the throne room of God. And the climax of Revelation 4 is this song that everyone sings. Everyone in heaven and earth and under the earth. And it is a song celebrating the creation. It's a song you are very familiar with. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. Why? Because you have created all things. You know that God's worthy of your praise just because he made you? Whether he ever saved you or not, you still owe him a duty of praise. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. And you'd think, man, I can't, I can't see anything deeper, more powerful than that. But then Revelation 5, he takes us in deeper to the throne room. It's necessitated because it's not enough anymore just to praise God for creating us. Although I do regularly. I got to confess, I'm so glad I exist. With all my flaws and faults, you know, and stuff I don't like about myself. I am so glad that God brought me into existence. It's just pure joy being alive. Is that how you feel? <laughs> If not, take two scriptures and go to bed. <laughs> Rinse and repeat. I'm glad he made me. Thank you, God. And, but you got to go deeper because something happened after creation. The fall. We fell. We brought confusion and rebellion into God for creation. There's not a human being alive that's not partly responsible for that. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way. We did our own thing. We have marred God's creation. But there's an answer. See, he goes into Revelation 5. And this is what's connected with 6. That's why I got to go back. Okay, there... Sitting on the throne is God himself. Indescribable. He holds a book in his hand with seven seals. So it's some kind of legal document. Writing on front and back, which means nothing more to say about the subject. Everything that has to be said is said in that book. It's complete. It's absolute. And it's some kind of... Um, the seals and the book... The book has to do with God undoing what we did through our sin. Not just personally in ourselves, but through the whole creation. You get to the end of the book of Revelation, God makes an announcement. Behold, I make all things new. Why? Because everything has been spoiled by sin. Do you believe that? Everything. And so when it says in 2 Corinthians 5, if any man be in Christ, isn't it great to believe in Christ? It's just beautiful. If any man be in Christ, behold, a new creation. He's not saying you're a new creation. He's saying you're part of a new creation. You've got your part in what God is doing in this earth. But the problem is the book tells, and, and the book brings about the undoing of sin. The problem is, it's sealed. And the reason why, as I said last week, this is God's economy. This is how God made it. If man ruined it, then a man has to fix it. If a man ruined it, then a man has to fix it. Or as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, by man came death. Therefore, by man can come the resurrection of the dead. In other words, God's not going to intervene and fix it in an amoral fashion, like a parent that makes up for everything their children do. 
By man came death. By man came the resurrection. And you got this problem illustrated in Revelation 5. Well, then who, what human being, what man is worthy to take this book out of the hands of God and break these seals so that we can fix this? He says, I looked and I couldn't find a man. There's not one man. Same thing Paul said in Romans chapter 3. There's not one righteous. No, not one. All together have gone astray. All have gone aside. All hate God. No one will seek God. There's not one good person on this earth. Do you believe that? Yes. Boy, when I first started reading the Bible, that might have been the hardest thing I could find to believe. Oh, surely there's some saint somewhere, Mother Teresa or something like that. Not one righteous. No, not one. He said, man, we look past, present, future, through all of humanity. You know how many billions of human beings have been on this earth? And they couldn't find one fit, one righteous. And then the apostle, uh, through this vision, the revelation, he makes you feel the anguish of it. Man, we're sunk. We're lost. You mean this won't be undone? And he says, I wept so many tears because I, we couldn't find one. And then finally the announcement would come. Wait a minute, we found one. There is a human being worthy to take the book and to open the seals and to bring about the reversal of the primal curse. Who is he? He says, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. A lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, this must be some kind of a man, a lion, a man who's a lion, a powerful king, a conqueror. He says, I looked to see the lion, and I saw a lamb with the marks of slaughter in his body. A lamb which had been slain, as we'll find out later, from the foundation of the earth. He looks for a lion, sees a lamb, but the lamb is a lion. The lamb conquered. The lamb didn't conquer by conquering. The lamb conquered by being conquered. He took the spear. He took your sins. You know that? Jesus took your sins. You have sinned, and you deserve to be punished. And Jesus came along and took your sins. It's fantastic. I look to see the lion. All I see is the lamb. And then you come to the second song, which I call the new song. Now, this is complete. See, you all go all the way, very deep into the throne room. And there they sing something called the new song, which is a very specific and technical expression. What's the new song? If the old song is praising God for creation, the new song is something like this. Worthy is the lamb that was slain for us. For he has redeemed us from our sins. By his blood, he has purchased us from the primal curse. He has laid down his life in self-sacrificing love. Worthy is the lamb that was slain, who by his blood made us into a kingdom of priests unto our God. I'm not worthy to be a priest, and neither are you. But he made us a kingdom of priests. Oh, sing unto the Lord, the Bible says. A new song. For he has done wonderful things. His right hand and his holy arm has gained salvation from us. The Lord has made known his salvation. He's revealed his righteousness in the sight of all the nations. All the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Well, we're about as far from Jerusalem as you can get anywhere on earth. We're the ends of the earth. And yet we're learning that Jesus died for our sins too. How many are glad that you got a share in this? See, and then the lamb comes before the throne. And he takes the book out of the hand of him who sits on the throne. And he alone is able to open these seals. Now, um, the end of the world... And the bringing in of the new world that God is made, making for the righteous is like the birth of a baby. So it says, I want a baby, I want a baby, I want a baby. What has to happen before you have a baby? You have to get pregnant. You might have some morning sickness. You have to have labor pains. You have to pop out a uh, mucus plug and a, a, a pimenta, a placenta. 
and you have to go through all this other stuff. If you focus on that, then that's, that's wrong. I mean, that's just what has to happen before a baby comes. Ever since the fall, nothing good can come into this world without pain, suffering, and death. And so that's what has to happen. What these seals are is the preconditions. What has to happen? What has to happen to fulfill the prayers of the church down through the centuries. I mean, how many here have ever prayed the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let thy kingdom come. Do you realize what you're praying? So, the first seal is broken. Verse, uh, Re Revelation 6, verse 2. Look, behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. The white horse is not Christ. In fact, before these things come to pass, one of the preconditions of making this whole world over again is the release of some spirit called the spirit of Antichrist and some imposter Christ. That's what Antichrist means, pseudo-Christ. A fake Messiah, a substitute, a world savior whom the world will look to and worship. And the Bible, when it talks about Antichrist, I talked about this last week, so I won't belabor it. It talks about three different things. There is the spirit of Antichrist, this spirit of do-goodism, this spirit of globalism is spirit of Antichrist. I tried to illustrate that last week. God made nations. The nations say, no, we don't want nations. We don't want borders. We want to be one. We want to fulfill uh, John Lennon's hymn. When the world will be one. God doesn't want that. Yeah, but man does. And that is the spirit of Antichrist. And the spirit of do-goodism. You notice every single person that the world just thinks is the best people on earth. Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa. These are the most horrible people on earth. What's that show you? The world's deceived. Doesn't know who's good or bad. Nelson Mandela did not go to jail for selling Girl Scout cookies. He went to prison for blowing up buildings with people in it. And yet he's a world hero. Gandhi. These people were awful. But the world loves do goodism. It's not good against evil in a blatant sense. It's good against good. It's what man calls good and what God calls good. The second seal is open. What has to happen? Uh, I saw a red horse, four. He went out and him who sat on it was granted to take peace from the earth and that men would slay one another and a great sword was given to him. I mean, man's always been violent. True, but once the red horse is loosed, violence is loosed like never before. Now, I told you something a couple weeks ago. I still stand by it. I don't know. I might, I might be wrong. I actually think these first two seals are already open. These are the preconditions for what has to happen for Jesus to come back. I remember when Russia was defeated in America and the West thought we won. Now we're going to have our way. We had no idea what was coming. You think we built billions and billions and billions of dollars of military. And if you had a set piece battle like in World War II, and no one would stand before us. That's what the first Gulf War proved. Yeah, but the way the terrorism is all over the world, it's like not a set piece military, more like a, a hive of bees. You can swat at them forever and never wipe them out. Not to mention our leader's willful blindness about that and their love of Islam. Violence. People have to get violent. Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be when it's coming of the Son of God. Well, in Genesis 6, it says right before the flood, the earth was filled with violence. Absolutely filled with violence. And violence, irrational violence is happening. Okay, I won't stay there. The third seal is broken. Black horse. People think it's famine. It's not famine. It's the black horse rider, as the angel has a set of scales, that's an economic symbol, okay? And basically what the third horse is, is the, is the manipulation of national and international economies. 
in such a way, as he, as he goes on to say in his message, to tip the scales in the favor of the super elite. A, a, lo a loaf of barley for a day's wage. But don't touch the oil and the wine. That's what that's all about. And I gave you James's prophecy against the rich in James chapter 5. Not, not, not where rich is as far as like a millionaire. No, I mean the very top people who can actually manipulate currency, who, whose policies actually kill people, who don't care, who actually, they're the, at the very top of this world, there are people that actually think there's too many people here. Okay? Bill Gates is in trouble in India. For supposedly inoculating people when it actually was killing people. He says, woe to you, Rich. You kill, and they cannot resist you. But their cries have gone into the ears of the Lord of hosts. You are fattening yourself for the days of slaughter. There has never been so much luxury. There has never been so much extravagance. There has never been so much ultra comfort. He says, the misery is coming on you. At the day of judgment, you have no idea. I know they're going to exempt themselves from misery. You know why? If you're rich enough, then you can build a pillbox in the ground. And that's what they're doing. By the way, that ought to be a sign to us. What do they know that most people don't know? They're building forts in the ground, underneath the ground, to withstand what's coming. Why? What is coming? Well, a lot of bad stuff's coming. And somehow a lot of these people know it. Let me go on. He says, uh, it says in verse 7, When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. And I looked, and behold, an ashen horse and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following him. Death in the grave or death in hell. Ashen is the, word, the Greek word chloros. What do we get our, what word do we get from that? Chlorine. Ashen is pale green, like a corpse can turn when it dies. It's death, okay? What, what has to happen before the Lord comes? The spirit of Antichrist has to be released. The man's internal violence finally is get, just gets set. God takes away the restraint. Go, go for it. Muslims were basically confined to one section of the world, and nobody went there that had any brains. But because of oil and money, now they're everywhere. And look what England's going through. Violence. Okay. The world economy... Is teetering. Here's where it's going to go before this is over. It's going to have to be reorganized, and the way it's going to be reorganized is that anyone that participates at all is going to have to take a mark on their hand or their forehead. If you refuse to take that mark, you cannot buy and sell in this world economy. The problem is, if you take that mark, you cannot go to heaven. You cannot be forgiven. Taking that mark would be seen by God as an act of worship. You can economize it all you want, but the way he looks at it, it's an act of worship of the beast, of the false system, of the Antichrist system. This is where the world economy is going to go. It's going to collapse. And there's people working to make it collapse, to weaken the dollar, to weaken every currency. And then before the end comes, a pale horse rides, and hell comes after him. Notice how he personifies death and hell. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. This is frightening. There are eight billion people on this earth. One fourth of the earth would be two billion people. Something so bad is coming that two billion people will be dead before it's over. And it, I don't think it's that very far off. I don't know what it is. It's a combination of things. I mean, World War III. If I went through a survey of the international nations, you know, the Muslim world, the, the Sunni world, the Shiite world, Russia, Turkey, North Korea. Pick your, pick your World War III. You've got about six choices. 
Nuclear power choices. This is going to happen. Now, now I see why. Uh, well, I don't see humanly speaking why, but now I see from a divine perspective why, why Obama armed the world's leading exporter of terrorism with a nuclear program. I get it. These things are going to be fulfilled. I'm not happy about it, by the way. I fear it. I hope we go up in the rapture before it. Now, if we had a vote for the rapture, I bet everyone would be pre-trib, right? You don't get to vote on it, though. <laughs> I'd love to go right now. You know what? Call me a coward. My constant prayer is Maranatha. Maranatha. You know what that means? Oh, Lord, come. Oh, Lord, come. I actually think Jesus wants you to want him to come. Anybody here? Jesus wants you to want him to come. Jesus wants you to see that there's very limited uh, future in this world. That it's under God's judgment, and so the judgment's going to fall. Anyway, let, let me go on. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar, in heaven this is, the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God. I just think of that expression. They were slain because of the word of God? What? Last summer, Chris and I went, or last fall, Chris and I went to England. And one of the towns in England is Oxford, one of the top universities in the world. And I just thought this was amazing because universities now would swear up and down and inculcate their students in one thing, there is no truth. Not really any truth. That's our philosophical crisis. They do not believe in truth. You can't say anything for sure. You can't say anything for sure. And right in the middle of this university is a massive monument. Basically, you go up steps, and it's like a church steeple on the top of this pedestal, and statues of these three people that were killed right there, burned at the stake on a pile of wood, given every chance not to be burnt. But they said, no, go ahead. In fact, one of them who had been tortured and signed a confession denying Christ, actually, before they even tied him up, put his hand in the fire. They said, what are you doing? I want to burn the hand off and sign that confession. I don't even like to burn the tip of my finger. Why'd they do that? Um, it says on there why they did it. Because they were try people were trying to force them to say... That when you take the bread in a communion service, that piece of bread is Jesus Christ. And they knew that wasn't true. And they didn't have a modern attitude about it. Oh, well, that's your truth. I got my truth. I'll just keep my truth to myself and let you have your truth to yourself. And they said, I'd rather be burned alive than bow down and worship the piece of bread. <laughs> Can you imagine that? right in the middle of one of the top universities of the world, Cambridge, which exalts that there is no such thing as truth. There's a monument to people who would rather die than deny the truth that have been shown them. So I want to challenge you today. You have been shown something, and Jesus' words about it are this. Flesh and blood didn't really show it to you. My Father in heaven... You know, I've witnessed people, you've witnessed people, you've witnessed people. We all go around witnessing to people, you know. And we say, man, I witnessed that person, and they believe. And that's great. That's one of the great joys of life. Everyone ought to witness to the Christian faith. On little or great matters, wherever you go, witness to the Christian faith. But know this, if anyone believes at all, with true saving faith, that's an act of God. You understand? In all the years I've been a pastor, I've never created one convert. I wish I could. But no, everyone that really believes, like for someone to believe, Pastor, I'd like to be baptized. I believe. Go up in front of a room full of people and do a foolish thing. Stand in a horse trough 
Look out on a group of people, some who you know, some who you don't know. And tell them, in your own words, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for me. Man, flesh and blood did not show that to you. My Father in heaven did. The thing is, in this sinful world, you're liable to be exposed on some level to difficulty for believing that and confessing that. And it's like the saying goes in the military, it applies more in the church. Some gave all. All give some. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. You realize that? There's a big spectrum of persecution. Persecution. What is persecution? Well, they rejected me. Well, they won't talk to me anymore. Well, they hate me. Well, they're trying to hurt me. Well, they got me fired. See, there's a big spectrum. Where's the end? I saw the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God under the altar. That's got to happen too. Look what he says here. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they maintained. Oh, the first martyr is Abel. Remember? Abel and Cain worship Christ together at a set place. And it was obvious in those days whether your prayer was accepted. I don't know, maybe fire came from heaven and consumed your sacrifice. Abel worshiped God and Cain worshiped God. Abel worshiped God with a bloody beast. Cain worshiped God with vegetables. But they were both worshiping God. Neither one was an atheist. And then when God's fire fell and he accepted Abel's offering, it hurt Cain very deeply. And one question that people got to answer is, what do you do when you get hurt? Okay. Now, God spoke right there to Cain and said, look, Cain, if you do the right thing, you know, what, well, you know what's right. You're offering the wrong offering. You've got to offer a bloody sacrifice. A life for life. The wages of sin is death. And God said, look, you do it right, I'll bless you. And Cain didn't have anything to say to God. His hurt turned into bitterness. And the Bible says in the New Testament, don't be like Cain who slew his brother, who slew his brother. And the word slew is not a word that means murdered. It's a sacramental word. It's a, a religious word. What's it mean? Well, let me just put it this way. We're called to worship and know God through Jesus Christ and him crucified, right? Oh, the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. That whole idea is repugnant to many people. you telling me someone has to die for my sins? They'd rather have, offer vegetables than a bloody sacrifice. Good works. Do goodism, right? But what the story of Cain and Abel teaches is someone is going to be made to pay for your sins. If not the God-appointed sacrifice, you yourself are going to take it out on someone else. I sat next to a Muslim on a plane, and I was witnessing him of Jesus Christ, and he smote the table. We Muslims need no sacrifice. I said, really, then why do you shed blood all over the world? Don't be like Cain. He slew his brother. No, he didn't offer him to God. He offered him to his own wounded feelings. But he did kill him. He did kill him. See, what he says here is that what has to happen before the world is renewed and God redeems everything is... I saw under the altar. Now, it's hard for me to picture, because usually an altar, it's a big, solid structure. So what does it mean under the altar? Does it mean they were underneath it, or does it mean they were 
clinging at the bottom of it like they cling to that for refuge? How many here believe that in the cross as a refuge? I will cling to the old rugged cross. It's always where I go when I'm hurting. Always where I resort to. And every time I lose sight of the cross, I get lost. But I go back to that cross, right? But um, he says, they were under the altar. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? How long before you will take vengeance? I've actually heard Christian theologians say, now that's not Christian. This is what I was talking about last week. We're so perverted, we don't know what Christian is anymore. Of course we want God to take vengeance on evil. Absolutely. It's complicated. I am evil, so I'm thankful for forgiveness. And I would that every person I know find forgiveness. But ultimately... Yes, I live for the day when God takes vengeance on the evildoers who slay the blood of his people with impunity, who destroyed marriage, destroyed civilization, destroyed children. Please, God, how long before you set things right? This is the theme of the, uh, you know, the parable Jesus taught, the woman and the unjust judge. What is she praying? Give me vengeance for my adversaries. What, what is she actually praying? Set things right. Set things in the right. What is the coming of Jesus? Among other things, it's the setting of everything right. Oh God, how long? How long? He doesn't rebuke them. What an unloving attitude you have. Peace, love, and joy for all. No, he doesn't say that. There was given to each of them a white robe. Remember the white robe? Oh, your work is done. You're clean. Rest a while. There was given to each of them a white robe. And uh, they were told that they should rest just a little while longer. I'm going to tell you something. It's just a little bit before Jesus comes. It won't be long. And until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been would be completed also. Now this is a revelation from God. You know what this is telling you? That God has ordained a certain number of people who should die for the truth. It's a specific number. Oh, one of the things that that tells me is, praise the Lord, no one's random. There's people in the Sudan that have been slaughtered for 20 years. No one cares. Black African Christians destroyed, slaughtered, raped, imprisoned by Muslims. People don't care. It's been going on for 20 years. I'll tell you who does care, though, God. We don't know their names. I'll tell you who does know their names, God. You think he's letting one of them drop to the ground without his notice? You think he's not taking down the names of those who did this? Or those who profited by it? Or those who encouraged others to do it? Or those who looked the other way when it was happening? <laughs> How long, oh God? Oh, just a little bit longer. Just the number's not full yet. See, it's a specific number. When that number hits, that, that, that tells me every single Christian martyr, which, by the way, there have been more Christian martyrs in the last 10 years than there were in the first three centuries of the church. Christians are the most persecuted people on, on earth. Every single martyr brings the day closer. Praise the Lord. The number's coming up. It's coming up. Twelve Egyptians the world saw kneel down at a beach in Libya, singing praise to Jesus. Been given every opportunity to renounce their faith and become Muslims. Did you know in the Quran, you don't even have to believe to become a Muslim? All you got to do is say the prayer, and then you're off the hook. That's all they want. Force you to say the prayer, whatever. They wouldn't do it. They could have, they wouldn't. Not one of them. 
ISIS captured 140 people in a Christian village in Iraq and had them all grouped together and one after another. You want to become a Muslim? No. Slit their throat. Want to become a Muslim? No. Slit their throat. Even children. Little five-year-old, little seven. You want to become a Muslim? No, I love Jesus, one said. How long, God? How long? I want to tell you something before I close about why I believe this is necessary. Now, what do you got to do to be saved? You got to believe. Amen? No trick questions here, all right? You got to believe. I told you, it's first. You got to believe, all right? In order to be saved, people have to believe. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth that he is Lord, and all that that involves... Believe that Jesus is God. Believe that he died for your sins. Believe that he came from heaven. Believe that he never sinned himself. Believe that his death was not just an execution by Rome, as they had thousands of those, but his death was a sacrifice to God. And believe that the way we know it was a sacrifice is that three days later, they had started to embalm him. But they had to quit because it was Sabbath. They came back to finish the embalming. And the the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. And an angel said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. How many know Jesus is alive? He's real. But here's the problem. You know what sin, iniquity, and debauchery does among other things? It actually strips away people's capacity to believe in anything greater than self. What do children, children believe, right? Little children believe. That's why children are very good to reach a kid while they're a child. Take them to church while they're young. Why? Children will believe greater than adults. Children just hook up with Jesus. Jesus said, you've got to become like a child to believe. What is our debauched culture doing to children? I'll tell you something. You know that concert in Manchester? Muslims uh, blew a nail bomb and people mourned because it was for teeny boppers. Teeny boppers, that's preteen and young teen girls. Listening to Erdrin Erdrin Smith, or I can't remember her last name. Anyway, the last words that they heard before they went into eternity was this vile pop singer describing various sex acts. Among other things, this debauchery kills the capacity to believe. You realize that? So now they praise this area as though she's a great person. Wonder, oh boy, she's a martyr herself. She is an apostle of Satan and was leading them to hell. And the Muslims just made it happen quicker for some. It is a messed up world. How messed up? I'll tell you how messed up. So messed up. So screwed up. That there's only one thing that can penetrate this self-generation. And actually make people take wonder and believe. And that is, if someone is willing to die for truth. If someone, people can wonder the world over. Those 12 Egyptians, what? All they had to do is say the confession. You don't have to mean it. There is no such thing as truth. No, not to them. Just say it and get them off your back. Then you can go back to being a Christian. No! Flesh and blood did not reveal it to me. My Father in heaven, I'd rather die than deny the truth. Well, I hope I would too. I hope we live for Christ and I hope we're taught and prepared to die for Christ. Because some of us are going to be called on to do it. There's a certain number of people that will. I'm not looking for it. If they flee into one city, go to the next. I'm, we're, not like, we're not like that cold in the early church that was throwing themselves on the Romans. Kill me, kill me, I'm a Christian. That's sick, okay. 
But every one of you should fix in your heart that if it comes down to denying Jesus Christ, what God showed you, or dying. And by the way, there's a thousand little ways you can die. People die by getting fired. People die by getting their name slammed. People die by being made fun of. People die by being bullied. There's a thousand ways Christians are dying. But in this vision, he saw the souls under the altar of God. Hey, wait just a little bit. A little bit more. Sixth seal, a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth, made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. I have no idea how that's going to work out. But there are celestial ph- phenomena that are pointing to the end. The stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. See, this is the end. This is what happens at the end. That's so what I told you. Revelation is not chronological. This, six, you know, this is it. No more need for the sky. Roll it up. What? Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and the slave and the free men hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Oh, I guess they were preppers. They had little caves that they had prepared. They said to the mountains and the rocks, well, how dreadful will it be that day? Fall on us. Hide us. From who? From the devil? From the Antichrist? Oh, no. Oh, something even more dreadful. Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Love spurned? Sacrificial love refused? You wouldn't have the Lamb? People wonder, is there a heaven or hell? Could God really have a heaven or hell? Of course. Where else are you going to go? If you reject everything that's true and beautiful, only one place for you. Hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the God, of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. Who is able to stand? Oh God. Oh God. There are many that could be saved if they'd hear the gospel. There are many who would believe if they were jarred out of their stupor. There are many, O Lord, that you are drawing and calling, but there's a tug of war for their very soul. O dear God, I pray that you would prevail by your spirit, that you would bring people into the kingdom of God, that you would not let one of us fall through the cracks, not not one of us go astray, O Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.